All right, let's get going here on the Panther Lawyer Post game. Saturday, September 25th, 2021, fresh home from Heinz Field, fresh off a victory for your pit football Panthers. They take down New Hampshire, pretty convincing fashion, 77-7. to And uh, there's there's going to be a refrain that we repeat throughout this, this post-game show where we say, where I say, over and over and I, over and over and over again, I know it's just New Hampshire. <laughs> That's going to always be, um, you know, something that gets brought up. The fact that this was just New Hampshire, that it was just an FCS opponent, that uh, there wasn't, you know, it it, it wasn't uh, an ACC team, it wasn't an FBS team or anything like that. It was it was just New Hampshire, and I realized that. And when we talk about 77 points, and we talk about 707 yards, and we talk about three guys with 100-plus all-purpose yards, and we talk about Kenny Pickett, and we talk about Rodney Hammond, and we talk about Izzy Abanikanda, and we talk about all these things, and the defense, in particular when we talk about the defense, and I know all along that it's just New Hampshire that they faced. But there's a thing I always say after games like this, after FCS games where there's a blowout win, the Austin P game last year, although I had a lot to say after that one. Um, but you know, when, when you have a blowout game like this, the thing I always say, and the thing I always think right off the bat, before you want to say, um, well, it was just this, or it was just that it was only an FCS team. It was only New Hampshire. The first thing I would say, you know, kind of the immediate reaction of the game is it's better than the alternative. And they did what they were supposed to do. All right. And, uh, it, it, you know, the old Chris Rock bit about you only did what you were supposed to do. You know, you don't get a cookie for that. I, I understand that. I don't, I, I mean, sometimes that applies when we talk about sports. I don't think that applies in this situation. I think there's something to be said for going out against a, you know, team with inferior talent, inferior talent, a lesser competition, and going out and taking them apart and really just kind of handing it to them uh, straight through. And, and there was no let up in this game. I mean, Pitt punted once with Kenny Pickett on the field, and you know, once with uh, did they even punt? I don't even think they punted once with Nick Patty on the field. You know, their their final two drives of the game, they went three and out, uh, but they go three and out on five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen drives, something like that. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, thirteen drives. They go three and out three times. That's pretty good. You know, and they score a touchdown every other time. I mean, there was no, uh, you know, it, you're not going to find many flaws in this game. And to some extent, you know, as I sit and I think about it, they're obviously about to go into ACC play. They're about to go down to Georgia Tech next week and open up conference play. And as I think about it, I mean, it's kind of ideal to go in to really the meat of your schedule on the you know, heels of a flawless performance. And they really were flawless. I mean, there are a few things that we can nitpick in this game and a few things we will nitpick in this game. New Hampshire had a long a long run that led to their one touchdown. Um, you know, Kenny Pickett, why is he even playing in the second half? I think we can nitpick that a little bit. The running game didn't dominate the entire, uh, you know, start to finish. It took a little while to get going, but they still ended up with 200... 52 rushing yards they gave up a couple sacks and had a couple issues in that way um that uh you know we can nitpick little things here and there but on the whole this was about as close to a flawless performance as you're going to get and and i think the score and the productivity reflects that where they just went up and down the field you know particularly on offense um you know, there, there was no stopping them. And on defense, there was very little that New Hampshire could do. Uh, let's see. New Hampshire's drives. I'm going to just bring up the drive chart. Three and out, three and out, three and out, five and out. Three and out, three and out, three and out, three and out, end of the half. Three and out, three and out. A nine play drive that ended with a turnover on downs. Uh, five and out, punt. Three and out, three and out. Uh, it was... It was exactly what this kind of game is supposed to be. And you can't take these games for granted. Pitt fans tell me all the time they know that these kind of games can get away from Pitt. And not just in terms of a loss. 
you know, not just not just that it get it got away from you and you lost the game to uh, to an FCS opponent, but you can have it be much closer than it should be. The Delaware game in 2019 comes to mind. The Youngstown State game in 2017 comes to mind. Uh, Virginia Tech against Richmond today is a 21-10 game. You know, that's not. I mean, obviously, that's still better. You still win. It's better than losing. Um, but it's not the kind of outcome that you would really like to think your team will have of uh, when you, you know, go out and, and sort of dominate against an FCS opponent. This is what you expect to be able to do. And, you know, coming on the heels of a loss to Western Michigan, it's not going to, this is something else I'll get out ahead of before we get too many comments about it. This doesn't erase the Western Michigan win. It doesn't erase the taste of a western michigan win that should still make you mad to use kenny pickett's term that should still make you pissed off he said the players were pissed off and they were i believe it and they should be just like you were you know they should probably take it even harder than you did as fans even though they moved on and tried to turn the page 24 hour rule get right back out to the game that had to stick in their crawl because they know they let one go one that they should have had just like you know they let one go <laughs> one that they should have had um this doesn't change that. Pretty much nothing short of an ACC championship is going to change how you feel about that Western Michigan game because that's ultimately going to be the difference between eight wins and nine wins or nine wins and ten wins or seven wins and eight wins or whatever it is. But coming out of that Western Michigan game, there was a ceiling on how much you could really accomplish the following week. I'm content to say that Pitt reached that ceiling with its performance today at Heinz Field. I didn't even introduce the show. It's the Panther Lair Post Game Show. I'm Chris Peak from PantherLair.com, the most comprehensive source of pit sports news on the internet, football, basketball, recruiting. You can find it all at PantherLair.com. And, of course, message boards where we have uh, you know hundreds and thousands of pit fans on there all day, every day, talking about pit sports, interacting with uh, uh, you know other pit fans and seeing what's going on and certainly a lot of conversation today in the aftermath of this game. If you're a pit fan, you need to go check it out. You know We hang out here. After the game for an hour, we hang out on Wednesday nights for an hour for the regular Panther Lair show, the weekly show. Um, but the PantherLair.com message boards are bumping all day, every day. So that's the place you want to go. Once you're done with this, uh, our little live stream uh, activity here, go check out the message boards and hang out. Of course, join the live stream. If you want to get in on the comments and questions, uh, you want to get in on the conversation, uh, this is the place to do it. You can come in the live stream and join the uh, the chat. You could be a super chatter, uh, throw a couple bucks at the podcast, and uh, you know support us. We appreciate that, and we'll definitely get your comments and questions read. And right off the bat, uh, a, a big time super chatter, William Schroeder. Uh, I can't thank you enough for being a a major uh, super chatter. Uh, William says, Chris, this donation is in honor of my son Caleb who graduated Pitt in 2018 and was the one who told me about your show, which is great, by the way. Caleb passed away this past May 13th, and I know he would have loved to donate. Uh, William, first of all, very, very sorry for your loss. Um, that's that's tremendously sad. Um, thank you so much for your support of the podcast. Uh, you know, Thanks to Caleb for you know following us and turning you on to the podcast. Um, thanks for uh, chiming in. You got some comments on... Uh, on the game, you got anything uh, you want to say about the game? Because uh, that's that's uh, a heavy heavy message there, my friend. But the best to you and your family on on your loss. That's that's something else. Um, I don't really know how to segue back into talk about the game. <laughs> I'm gonna have a drink of beer. All right, let's get to some comments and questions here. I'll chime in on what i think as we uh we talk about this brock madonic starts it off uh says it's great to see our buddy matt anning on the sidelines of the game today great job by pitt even better kid yeah matt's been showing up for a few years as an honorary captain for pitt great kid you know bubbly energy uh you know just really uh great guy and and he's around the team and the team seems to you know really feed off his energy and he gets excited about the team and uh he was the captain today and they came out with a you know, like I say, about a flawless performance. So it's hard to hard to argue with the results there. Uh, Bobby Fitzmaurice says, well, they did what they were supposed to do. Still don't know why Izzy Abanacanda isn't running back one. Is Vincent Davis got the start? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, you, you go down the stats, man, and I, I mean, just from the eye test, and it wasn't, you know, they didn't all get the same number of opportunities. Vincent Davis had seven carries, whereas Rodney Hammond had 17, and, you know, Izzy Benacanda had 13, plus a couple of catches. Hammond had a couple of catches, uh, or, you know, so it's not a perfect comparison, but I mean, when you look at the production, you watch the running backs on the field, I mean, who looks like the best backs? And again, this is against New Hampshire, but all these guys were playing against New Hampshire. You know, Vincent Davis was playing against New Hampshire today, just like Abanacanda and Hammond were playing against New Hampshire today. So who looks like the best backs out of that, out of that group? I mean, it's Abanacanda and Hammond. They looked like the best backs on the team today. Um, and and that's not to be disrespectful of Vincent Davis. I mean, I, I I have a lot of respect for Vincent Davis. I think he plays hard. I think he runs hard. I think he has good vision. I think he's able to make some guys miss every now and then. I think he's able to, you know, if there's a hole, he can he can hit the hole and he can take off and and get some longer runs. He had a couple really nice runs on the first couple drives today. You know, 19 yard run, 20 yard run, that kind of thing. But when you look at the overall package. And you look at Hammond averaging six yards a carry on 17 attempts. And you look at um, <laughs> you look at Abanacanda averaging six yards a carry on 13 attempts. I mean, the yards per carry average isn't really backing up my points in Vin- since Vincent Davis averaged 7.1. But, I mean, I think you, you've got three backs right now that all look pretty good uh, when they've got an opportunity, when the line gives them some chances to run. And I thought all three backs really found most of their success. And this is kind of funny. He found most of their success um, running off the left side and running up the middle. And and that's funny because there was so much talk. There's been so much talk over the past few weeks about changing up the offensive line, about getting um, particular Mac Gonsalves out there. And I think Gonsalves is going to be a really good offensive lineman for Pitt. Uh, I've, I've been driving that hype train as much as anybody over the last year and a half. And so he got into the starting lineup today because Owen Drexel wasn't able to play. So Jake Cradle moved from right guard to center and Gabe Hoy moved from right tackle to right guard. And Gonsalves stepped in uh, to start at right tackle. Not necessarily his natural position. He's been practicing more left tackle, but spent this week getting ready to work at right tackle. And that's where he was in the game. Um, it seemed to me sort of anecdotally, particularly, you know, early on, I mean, as, as the game wore on late third quarter and throughout the fourth quarter, I wasn't necessarily charting every run, but the success that they had was largely running to the left side and running through the middle as opposed to running um, on the right side. I mean, I think they're, you know, probably Carter Warren and Marcus Miner have been their best offensive linemen so far this season. It'll be interesting to see if, uh, you know, can, it'll be interesting to see what the lineup looks like when they go to Georgia Tech. You know, uh, Owen Drexel still kind of up in the air. Pat Narduzzi wasn't really committal, uh, didn't commit to having Drexel back for next week. So we'll see what happens there. And then we'll see what happens when Drexel does return. You know, does he step back into the starting lineup? Does Jake Cradle move back to right guard? What do they do with Hoy and Gonsalves? My guess, I, I mean, you know, I don't know the details of um, Owen Drexel's injury. My, I, I, He wasn't even in uniform today. Uh, I would, I don't know. I mean, I can't speculate. I was going to say I would guess that he doesn't play next week. I, I can't speculate on that. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if he's going to be ready or not. Uh, but coming back to the running backs, there's just something about the way Abanacanda runs with the ball, you know, and, and the size he's got, uh, and, and kind of the same thing with Hammond. I mean, pushing forward, you know, they're down there close to the end zone. He looks like he's going to get a couple yards, and he ends up with nine. You know, and on the next carry, he gets handed, you know, from the four, I guess it was, takes a handoff, and it looks like he's going to get stuffed, but he just keeps pushing and driving, and he drives his way into the end zone. And that's a, a part of Rodney Hammond's game that I didn't really – realize you know if you go back to looking at the recruiting class that that 2021 recruiting class there were two backs in that group and there was Rodney Hammond and there was Malik Newton and Newton was the bigger back out of the two Newton was the more high profile back out of the two Hammond was the smaller guy the scat back the change of pace back well he runs bigger than he is you know he runs with some power and I think we saw that a little bit in the UMass game and uh saw that in this New Hampshire game as well didn't really get many opportunities. Uh, didn't play at all. I don't, I don't think at, at Tennessee. Only got a couple of uh, snaps and a couple of drives uh, in the Western Michigan game, and that didn't go well because he had a fumble. 
so you take the level of competition into consideration when you're talking about UMass and New Hampshire, but it's hard to argue with the results. 100-yard game, three touchdowns for Rodney Hammond, 104 yards of, of offense, of all-purpose you know, all purpose yards. I mean, it's really hard to argue with that. That's that's production. Those are those are good results from Rodney Hammond. But I mean, am I going to play him above Izzy Abanacanda, who had 148 yards of you know all-purpose yards? I don't know. I, I guess if it was me going into the rest of this season, the next eight games, you know, this the, the conference schedule, I'm I'm still an Abanacanda guy. <laughs> I've been on this train for a while. I'm starting him. And I'm mixing in Davis and Hammond. And then as one of those three establishes himself to be the guy in any given week, that's that's who I'm sort of sticking with. I I think a Banacanda still has that high ceiling. I think you saw it, he had the what 25 yard, I think, reception at one point where I mean just you, you send your receivers and, and tight ends down the field, everybody clears out, and there's Rodney or Izzy Abanacanda standing in the middle of the field all by himself. And he's you know, easy catch, turn around and run for 25 yards. I mean, he's he's that he's he's a good player, and uh, we'll be interested to see the um, you know the numbers that kind of come back on missed tackles and and yards after contact and that kind of thing. Because I think Abanacanda and Hammond both did really well in that regard. I think they both did a really good job running after contact. Uh, but you know, again, we take the level of competition into consideration. But and and we'll see when they play an ACC team next week. You know. But you can't argue with the rushing game today, and and how those you know as a you know as a whole going for 252 yards on the ground and five rushing touchdowns, and then individually when you look at Ham and Abanacanda and even Davis, who I think had a pretty solid game on limited opportunities. All right, let's get uh, got some super chatters coming in. Let's see, R J C Man 38, one of our uh, regulars, love to have you uh, in there. Uh, no no comments yet. If you got something to say, let me know, and we'll uh, we'll make sure we get to you. Um, Brock McDonick says, uh, Chris, have you ever gotten the chance to meet Matt talking about, uh, the honorary captain, Matt Anning, the young man who was there today said, Kenny, Kenny seemed pumped to have him there today. Yeah. I think the players like it. He comes to practice during the week, uh, when he's going to be the captain. I think they've done it at least once a year for the past few years. I've seen him coming around, uh, and, uh, you know, they, they have him at practice before the game, you know, the week he'll come down one day. During the week, and the players all get into it. He was in the post game press conference. He's sitting there watching, and all the players come over and say hi to him after they they do their their media opportunity. It's um, uh, you know, it's it's all uh, it's it's good. You know what I mean? I, I think it's really good. It's good outreach for the program, and it's it's good to give those guys some kind of. I, I think those guys can get some extra inspiration from from a young man like Matt. Um, Kevin Plowcha, one of our regulars here on the live stream says, uh, what's up, Chris coming to you live from the UPMC event center during a Robert Morris volleyball game. Couldn't watch the game today. Was too busy watching Robert Morris win. Wasn't worried. Uh, hail to pit. All right, Kevin, hey, check out the volleyball, you know, Pitt uh, definitely got the win. You, you, you probably were watching on Twitter as the, the numbers just kept rolling up the 77 to seven Pittsburgh sports all the time says, all right, as the head coach said, we got what we needed. It's time. Uh, we got what we, we, we did what we needed to do. It's time, uh, for Georgia tech. And yeah, that's the, that's the chest, the test that's coming up here. And, um, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be interesting. Uh, got a lot of thoughts heading into that Georgia tech game. And, you know, obviously we'll talk about it on, um, we'll talk about it more on the Wednesday night live stream and on through the week on pantheware.com. But, you know, just kind of looking at, we'll, we'll stick with this game for now, and then we'll keep talking. Um, Mike Shaner says, will Kenny have more touchdowns this season than his career total to this point? Uh, let's see. In his first three seasons, Kenny Pickett had 39 touchdown passes. He threw five today, so he's now got 15 this season. Uh, 15 through four games, what does that work out to? That's about 45 touchdowns. Uh, which would eclipse his the total for the past four seasons combined. He's already set a new career high for single season passing touchdowns. He threw 13 each of the last two years and 12 the year before that. He's got 15 this year, 15 touchdowns, no interceptions, something like uh, about 1,300 yards through four games. 
Kenny Pickett's not going to get Heisman buzz. I mean, probably not unless Pitt, you know, is under, you know, doesn't lose a game, doesn't. If Pitt beats Georgia Tech and Virginia Tech, goes into the Clemson game and beats Clemson, and Kenny Pickett has a big game, then yeah, he'll start getting some buzz. Here's the thing about Pickett, okay? Here's the thing that's going to get him on the national radar and is really going to establish him in the lore of of Pitt quarterbacks, sort of the legends. And I was thinking about this because there's a thread on the message boards comparing Kenny Pickett and Tyler Palco. Who's better? Who's better? And the thing that Palco had, all right, and, um, you know, to some extent, Rod Rutherford, but the thing that Palco had was that big game. The thing that Nate Peterman had, and, and Peterman didn't put up the numbers that Pickett is putting up right now, but the thing he had is that signature game. And Kenny Pickett's got that Miami game. And and that Miami game in 17 was, I mean, he had a big part in that. You know, we always talk about Ben Roethlisberger. He didn't really have a huge role in that 2000, you know, the 2005 Super Bowl, that first one they won with Roethlisberger. He got them there, but he didn't have a huge role in that game. Kenny Pickett in that Miami game in 2017 was a huge part of it. I think he accounted for three touchdowns, like two rushing and one passing. He didn't throw for 400 yards, uh, but he made the plays to win the game. That's about it in terms of signature games. You think about Nate Peterman. I don't know if you can remember, but we didn't really think all that much of Nate Peterman prior to that Clemson game, particularly because I think the week before was the Miami game or maybe the, the Virginia Tech game, one of those two, you know, a game they lost. Um, but And it, he was just okay through the first like half of that season. Uh, it really up until the Clemson game. Then he goes to Clemson, he throws five touchdowns, leads an upset of you know number two team in the country. And Nate Peterman, Nate Peterman becomes something of a legend for Pitt, right? Tyler Palco, I mean, was always going to be a, a legend in Pitt history because of who he was and kind of his attitude and sort of how he led and all that stuff. But the Notre Dame game in 2004 truly cemented him in that position. Kenny Pickett needs that signature game, something other than the Miami game in 2017, something where, and I was going to say something where he carries the team on his back, but he carried the team in that game in addition to the defense. He needs a game where he takes it over, like Peterman did against Clemson, like Palco did against Notre Dame. He needs that game. And the Clemson game coming up in a month, next time we're going to be at Heinz Field, October 23rd for the Clemson game, that's going to be the best opportunity Pickett's got. Now, when he gets the Thursday night primetime national TV uh, you know, duel with Sam Howell, that's going, to, that's going to be a pretty good opportunity too. But to take on Clemson, if you can play – a really good game against Clemson. Uh, you know, if you can lead a victory against Clemson, if you can throw a bunch of touchdown passes against Clemson. And as we're saying this, it's, you know, we're, we're taping this live, but Clemson and NC State are tied at seven in the third quarter, by the way. Game at NC State. Just to uh, give you a little context on, on what we're talking about here. But if that's going to be Pickett's opportunity for that big game, that signature game, they can really cement him. He's on pace. He's if he doesn't get hurt, if he keeps playing even close to how he's been playing, he's going to finish as the number one all-time leading passer in pit history. He's going to have all these yards. He's going to have all these passing touchdowns. What he's going to need, the, 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 that piece, is the signature win, that big, big win. And that's his opportunity that's going to come up. You know what I mean? And, and who knows? By the time they get to the Carolina game, maybe that'll be even an even bigger opportunity. But that Clemson game is going to be Kenny's opportunity to really not only put himself in the national conversation as one of the premier quarterbacks in college football, which is how he's been playing thus far, 15 touchdown passes in the month of September, but to put himself to really kind of cement his legacy as a pit quarterback. You know, he's going to have those stats and he's going to be at the top of the record books, but you need... You, you need Tyler. You need to be Tyler Palco trucking a guy. You know what I mean? And, and Kenny's done that a few times. And given the state of things this year, I would not recommend he try to truck anyone. But you need to be Tyler Palco throwing five touchdowns at, or four touchdowns or however many it was at, at, at uh, Notre Dame. You know, you need to be Nate Peterman, who is not on that level of where Palco and, and is and where Pickett is headed. You know, but you need to have that, that big game, that signature game. And that's the opportunity he's going to he's going to have a chance to get it. Um, when that time comes, uh, let's see here. Um, John, uh, Christofich says, do you think Randy Bates will be fired after the season? If Pitt's defense doesn't play better, uh, you know, 
I'll tell you what they did today. They gave up 160 yards and one touchdown. They gave up one play. 70 yards came on one play of the 160 they allowed, which led to the one touchdown they allowed. They had three sacks. They did not allow a single conversion on third down. Um, they Anything else here? Two turnovers, right? I think they had, uh, yeah, two turnovers. They had a safety. I mean, look, I know the defense was really rough last week, but that's done. And, and I'm talking about this game right here. And let's see what the defense does over the court, the next eight games. Okay, we'll, we'll find out. We'll see what the defense does over the next eight games. Do I think Randy Bates is going to be fired if they have a, a really rough next eight games? I don't know. You know, Randy Bates' defenses have been pretty good for the past few years, with exceptions, but pretty good for the past few years. Um, I don't know if he's going to get fired, though, and I'm not really even thinking in those terms right now. Mad Dog, uh, XNE, DND, and 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 D, and D says, uh, Do you think Jordan Addison is a first round pick in the NFL? I mean, <laughs> he's playing at a pretty high level right now. Six touchdown catches in the last two games. 100 and I forget how many, how much he had against Western Michigan, but he has 179 yards and, uh, you know, on, on six receptions today. He's playing at a really high level. I think the key with Addison. He's going to have to test really well because he's not the biggest receiver. You know, he's 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 on the smaller size side. Uh, and that's not just, you know, sort of weight, but I mean height. He's not the tallest guy, but he can make plays. You know, he's he can run routes really well. He gets yards after the catch. Uh, he, he broke tackles. He took that one screen pass, and he had some great downfield blocking on that screen pass. But he took the one screen pass and goes, you know, in for a touchdown on it. Um yeah, he he's doing everything right right now. I mean, you talk about somebody who's pretty much flawless. Jordan Addison was pretty much flawless in this game and has been for most of this season. He's got a couple drops. Uh, that that's going to happen when you see the level, the volume of targets he, that Jordan Addison sees. Um, but I, I mean, I think he's got all the elements in place aside from his size. And so, if, if you're lacking in one element like that, you need to make up for it somewhere else. So he needs to run a great 40 and, you know, have a really good vertical. He needs to train really hard. You know, he needs to, you know, he needs to train. And I think he can run a great 40, and I think he can have a great vertical. Uh, he's got to put in the time with, with his training when that time comes. I mean, he's got at least one more year here. Uh, so then we'll see after that. Um, Pittsburgh Sports All the Time says, Clemson is once again on the ropes. Curious on your thoughts as a whole this year. Yeah, I was just um, checking that out. Clemson and NC State tied 7-7. to It's really, uh, you know, the ACC, that game's tied in the third quarter. So we'll see kind of what happens there. It looks like NC State's got the ball, but they're, they have a long field to go. I mean, the ACC right now, you know, you look at Clemson, the starting quarterbacks thrown two touchdown passes. And they're in their fourth game right now. He's got one today, and he had one prior to this this game. They're running. They were running the ball well, though. Uh, you know, this game today they haven't been running it all that great. As we sit here again, they're in the like third quarter. They've got eight rushing yards net. Uh, Will Shipley, who had a pretty good game last week, has five carries for nine yards. So that's not looking hot. The thing about uh, Clemson is their defense is just playing lights out i mean they are really playing at a high level so you still keep clemson in that number one spot but you know what do you do after that do you look at carolina you know do you look at you, you probably don't look at miami at this point virginia's sliding um you know boston college is 4-0 they beat uh, missouri in overtime today uh, i don't know who else I mean, North Carolina is probably your next best team. Boston College, Wake Forest, maybe. Wake Forest beat Virginia on Friday night. They're four and zero now and two and zero in the ACC. I mean, th those are those are like your options, just sort of based on records. You know, I think you like Carolina. I like Carolina because of how Sam Howell is playing. You know, comes into this weekend as the fifth leading rusher in the ACC. Well, there's no clear number two, and and if as Clemson continues to not sort of separate itself i don't know that there's a clear number one they're still ranked in the top 10 and i think if they they escape nc state with a win in this game today they're going to stay in the top 10 i don't think they're going to drop out of the top 10 after a win um 
but they're not you know they 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 have not separated themselves and another loss by Clemson it, you know could drop them below a North Carolina you know I don't know if they would drop below Wake Forest but if Wake keeps winning or if Carolina keeps winning and if Clemson loses another game then yeah I mean I think you drop them uh, which is wild. We never would have considered that possibility in the past, but that's where it is right now, and that's kind of how Clemson is playing. So I don't think there's a real clear. Like I say, I mean, the question that I've been trying to figure out is who's the clear number two behind Clemson. Well, we got to really still even consider is Clemson. I, I'm, I, I'm, they're still the number one, but the separation is less than it has been at any point in the last six years, seven years. You know they're they're closer because they're not their offense is just not clicking like it has in the past. Um, they're playing great defense, but they're not putting up points the way they need to. Uh, RJC Man Thirty Eight says you need need to see better run production on offense. They had two hundred fifty two yards on the ground today, scored five rushing touchdowns. They they do they do need to get better running the ball. There's no question about that. They have to get better running the ball. They've got to be able to to do it consistently against a higher level of competition, the old cliche that you throw the ball to score points and run the ball to win games. There, there's some truth to that. It's a cliche. It's a football guy cliche, but there's truth to that. They do need to do a better job. And I think they've got the talent at running back to do it. The offensive line has to come together. Um, I, I agree with you that they need to, um, I agree with you that they need to do it better and more consistently, but they had a good game today. Let's see what they do at Georgia Tech, where they actually ran the ball well last year. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Pittsburgh Sports All the Time asks, so what the heck happened to A.J. Davis? You know, I don't think he's been dressed for the last few games. I don't think he, uh, if he made the trip to Tennessee, he did not play. He was not dressed for the Western Michigan game. I don't think he was dressed today. He's been hurt. He's been dealing with an injury. And that has, uh, you know, it's it's kept him out. And But, I mean, quite frankly, Hammond, Abanda Kanda, Vincent Davis look like better options. You know, I, and that's not to be uh, negative about A.J. Davis, but, I mean, these guys look like they've got a higher ceiling and, and have a better, you know, can produce better. Uh, Will Z says, Izzy and Rod have to be the combo. Vincent Davis can be the third and long back. Yeah, I mean, I think you can mix and match. I mean, I think there there are things you can do with Vincent Davis. You don't want to be in a situation where you only use certain guys in certain situations. You don't want to be predictable like that. Oh, Vincent Davis only does this. Rodney Hammond only does that. Izzy Abanacanda only does this. You, you don't want to be predictable like that. You want, um, you know, you want to be able to use all guys in all situations. It's... Uh, you know, it, it. You just have to figure out who can function best in certain, you know, setups. You know, and in certain down and distance or certain game situations. Ideally, you'd like to be able to go. You know, just draw a name out of a hat, and all three could function at a high level in all situations. That not that's not necessarily the case right now. Um, but it does seem like Hammond and Abanacanda are coming on. So, we'll see. Talk is Pitt says people need Pitt fans need to shut up and enjoy the win. Uh, where do you go? Lost your comment. You moved. Uh, Pit fans need to shut up and enjoy the win. We can win, and people would still complain. Yeah, and and look, I mean, I was scratching my head as much as anybody when Kenny Pickett came out and played in the second half. I don't know why you would have Kenny Pickett playing in the second half. I don't know why you would have Jordan Addison playing in the second half. And I don't know why you would have Lucas Crawl playing in the second half. To me, those guys are so valuable to this team. You're sitting on a 49-7 to lead. You don't need them on the field in the second half. It's not worth the risk. And maybe I might even do the same with, you know, like a Jake Cradle, a Carter Warren, a Marcus Miner. And they, and they did pull Miner out, Miner out for a few series. Uh, I think Blake Zabovic got in there for, for some time, for some snaps. Um, but then they, they went back to Miner again. I, I wouldn't do it. You know what I mean? I would take these guys out and keep them out at, at halftime. There was no need for any of them to play in the second half. So, I mean, I can understand some of the gripes there. You give up a long run, uh, you know, you make, make a mistake here, make a mistake there, but overall it's a, a pretty demonstrative win. And like I say, a pretty flawless win. Hail to pit 44 says I'm fine with Vincent Davis being in the rotation, but Izzy is clearly a more dynamic playmaker and needs to be the lead back. I mean, I, I, I don't disagree. You know, I, I always say that, um, I kind of defer 
to the coaches on uh, you know personnel things. They see these guys more. They have them in film meetings. They you know they they go over the playbook with them and all that stuff. And and it's hard for me to sit here and say I know better than them. They've they've spent they have, they have a, a a whole lot more information to consider than I do. You know, I mean, they, they have a lot more to evaluate and look at than I do. And so it's hard for me to be, I, I always, I, I hesitate to go too far overboard in criticizing the personnel decisions, but it looks to me, and I think it looks to a lot of people, like Abana Khan is the one who's got the highest ceiling and Rodney Hammond might not be that far behind him. Um, but, you know, the coaches are seeing things that they believe you know, that lead them to believe that uh, Vincent Davis is the one they have to go with. So we'll see how the rotation shakes out. Now, I mean, I wouldn't be shocked at all if they go to Georgia Tech. Vincent Davis is the starting running back, and Izzy Abanacan is in on the third series and doesn't give up the job. You know what I mean? Like, I, I could see no matter who starts, it'll be interesting to see who ends up with the most snaps, most carries, most touches. Um, Pittsburgh sports all the time says we got two huge games coming up. Hopefully the defense gets it together because the other side of the ball is rolling right now. Yeah. That's where the big, um, uh, that's where the big (laughs) conflict comes from because you've got the offense playing at a really high level, historically high level. This is the most points they've scored in a game since like 1926 This is the most yards they've ever gained in a, a game ever. And so they're playing at a really, really high level. And uh, Kenny Pickett is playing at a really high level. And his receivers and his tight ends are playing at a really high level. And the offensive line is protecting him and giving him time to to see the field and make those throws. You need the defense to step up, though. Um, The defense has to be better than it was against Western Michigan. It has to be better than it was against Tennessee. And and we talked about this probably on on, – Wednesday night. I know I talked about it Saturday morning on the Panthers Insider Show, radio show on uh, 93.7 The Fan, that the only thing to kind of, I think if you want to be talked back from the ledge a little bit, the one thing I would say is that when you look at the Tennessee game and the Western Michigan game, you know, Tennessee, I think the defensive breakdowns where guys are running wide open down the middle of the field, they were fundamental issues. Guys just not playing properly and you watch some of the clips where guys end up wide open and and you've got two defenders like a safety and a corner following the tight end into the flat you don't need two you don't need two defensive backs following a tight end into the flat one will suffice you know because while two of you guys were over here with the tight end in the flat that receiver's downfield all by himself that's a mistake that's not a physical issue. That's not a matter of subpar talent or inferior talent. That's just a fundamental mistake. And something else that starts the same way is fundamental. You know, that's, that's what I almost said there. And so I'm glad that I caught myself. But that you, you screwed up. Okay, that was, a, that was a mistake. Fundamental mistake. And then when you go to the Western Michigan game, I mean, it was clearly a schematic issue against a quarterback who was very good at running those RPOs. Very good at taking advantage of the way Pitt defended RPOs. Now, with the fundamental things, with the Tennessee game, that can be corrected. You rep it. You watch film. You talk about it. You study it. You go over it in the classroom until those guys, and you you drill it and drill it and drill it until those guys get it, until they understand how to play, that they have to trust their teammate. Now, I see that tight end running over there, but I know I need to stay back here. My first instinct is better go get that guy, but I got to trust my teammate to go do his job. And I have to do my job because if one of us doesn't do our job, we're going to leave a guy wide open behind us 20 yards downfield. That can be corrected. And then the issue, and then the Western Michigan game where it's, it's a schematic issue. I mean, you have to go back and self scout. I asked Pat Narduzzi about this on, on, on Thursday of, you know, how much of your time is it just, you know, you're spending an hour every day, just looking at film of you, not trying to figure out the opponent's tendencies and personnel and all that, just figuring out where you screwed up and how other teams are going to try and take advantage of it. And he said, yeah, that's that's part of it. And so that's what they need to do. And then, you know, the, the other kind of truth about those RPOs is it's not like everybody can just, uh, just wake up one week and say, we're going to run a bunch of RPOs this week. I was on the um, Panther pregame show with Larry Richard and Pat Bostic on, on the fan this morning before the uh, the game against New Hampshire. And we were talking about it, and Pat Bostic said, you know, you have to major in those kinds of things. You can't just 
roll out of bed on Sunday morning or Monday morning and say, hey, we're playing Pitt this week. Let's put in a bunch of RPOs because you're not going to be able to do it enough to be good enough at it to really take advantage like that. And so, you know, it's not like every team on Pitt's schedule is going to be able to just throw these things into their game plan and, you know, crush Pitt with it. Now, some of the teams that already have it, like North Carolina, they're going to they're gonna get theirs against Pitt because I, I think there are some changes that Pitt can make, but there's still some fundamental ways that they play, some fundamental structural things in their defense that are probably still going to get exploited against a good quarterback who can run that kind of offense. And Sam Howell's a really good quarterback. He's going to get yards. Now, fortunately for Pitt, uh, Carolina's defense has looked suspect up to this point. We'll see what they do today, but um, they've looked suspect up to this point um uh, as we're sitting here it looks like uh nc state scored and they uh touchdown pass and they are leading 14 to 7 in the third quarter i know that you know when you listen to this podcast later in the week they're watch this video on on sunday or monday you're gonna you're already gonna know the outcome of the clemson nc state game but it's um worth monitoring right now it's interesting to watch right now but anyway so i uh, you know there were issues against tennessee and there were issues against western michigan I don't think they were insurmountable issues. I don't think they were issues that can't be corrected and addressed and fixed going forward in the final eight games of the season. I think those guys can play better. I think the coaches can prepare better, can game plan better, and the defense can improve. I don't know if it's going to be as good as previous years, but I think it can be better than it was the two games prior to today. Roy Speakham says, can't believe the bubble screen to Addison worked so well. I'm guilty of screaming, not that, the minute it's thrown the other times. Uh, wasn't that the same that started the Tennessee game very unsuccessfully? I mean, they've run a lot of screens this year. They, they run them a lot because I, I think they're trying to find that balance between stretching the field and then the quick stuff out here. That, that you know, if you, if you stretch the field enough, teams are going to have to adjust how they play, and that should open up opportunities for, for the screen game. Now, just they, they haven't hit very often. But they hit today, and the reason they hit today, and I'm going to have to go back and watch the film. Oh, God, I sound like the coach. Uh, I have to, I'm going to have to go back and rewatch some of the game to see on Jordan Addison's long touchdown with the screen who was blocking for him because there were two other receivers out there that made key blocks. And then once he can't cut across the field, there was another block or two. I think a Banacanda had a block. Um, you know, those guys get as much credit for the touchdown as Addison. Well, Addison gets all the credit, but those guys deserve a lot of credit for helping him, helping spring him for that touchdown. Um, Brock McDonick says, finally good to see Elliot Donald out there today. Also, though, it's a small sample size. Uh, I'll share comment the thing always jumps around uh also though it's a small sample size pj o'brien and noah bigelow have impressed in the secondary yeah elliot donald got out there late in the game nikai johnson was out there it was a whippy old defensive line with donald and johnson i think at one point they had um devin danielson in between them too uh so you had you had four, three whippy old guys um lined up and who's the other one i think it was chris maloney where's he from uh, he's from LaSalle College High School. He's from Eastern PA. Not a Whippeal guy. Should have put Noah Palmer out there or somebody like that. Dayon Hay. Or no, he's a City League guy. But yeah, you. Uh, it, it was it was good to see those guys out there. And you know, PJ O'Brien. We talked. He was a, a topic of conversation on last week's podcast because he tweeted after the game. Feel like I'm working so hard, not getting anything from it, and all this stuff. Uh, and obviously, people that took that to mean that he was thinking about leaving and everything. Well, he played a lot today. He was one of the top reserves at safety. Uh, I don't think Rashad Battle played any snaps on defense uh, that I saw. So when Eric Hallett and Brandon Hill came out of the game, it was P.J. O'Brien and, and Judson Talender going in at the two safety spots. Uh, so O'Brien played played a lot. We'll see kind of how he graded out and what his ultimate production was. I don't know if – see what he – actually, he finished with a decent amount of tackles, I think. He had four tackles, pass breakup, and a quarterback hurry. So pretty good game for O'Brien. Yeah, I agree. Um – Roman <laughs> Roman says, uh, the ACC sucks booty meat. All right, that's weird. If Pitt takes care of business, they will be in Charlotte and have a shot to beat Clemson maybe for the second time. Look, if Pitt takes care of business, sure, they're, they're going to, you know, they'll they'll go, um, they'll, they'll, they can go on a run, but, you know, they have to take care of business. I mean, that's, and, and this is the thing is we don't know really what they're going to do. You know, I mean, we, I don't know what to expect out of this game at, um, at Georgia Tech on Saturday. 
I think I know Pitt can win it. You know, I, I, I know they're good enough to win it. I know their offense is rolling right now. The defense is going to have to round into form. Um, Georgia Tech, uh, they play Carolina tonight. So we'll see how that goes. That'll give us some idea of, of where Georgia Tech's defense is. Oh, and they play it at the Falcon Stadium? That's terrible. Um, sorry, I got distracted there. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll see. I don't know what to expect out of this team because we've seen some different things, you know, obviously in the last couple of games. And we've seen the offense really roll, but the defense have some suspect moments against FBS competition. So we'll see. Um, Royce Beacom says, Pickett will be the marquee player if the defense can limit the opposing offense to allow him to shine. Example, the Western Michigan game last week, further defense would have helped Ken Kenny to shine nationally. Uh, I mean, I think – it didn't help that his team lost, if that's what you mean. He threw for six touchdowns. You know, I mean, he was he was one of the top performers in the country last week, except, yeah, I think you do get overlooked when your team loses. So you need to uh, win the game um, to, yeah, I mean, get positive attention, right? I mean, that's that's kind of what it, what it comes down to. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard when you are not a uh, – when you're not winning games, it's hard to uh, get attention nationally. Um, David Allen says, uh, on the positive side, the team appeared to get through without injuries and lots of backups played. Yeah, I didn't see anybody come out of the game with an injury. Obviously, they had a couple guys who were out due to injury. Oh, and Drexel didn't dress. Jared Wayne didn't dress. I think Cervasia Dennis was held out. Um, he was in uniform. Uh, probably could have gone if they needed him, but... I think they were trying to get him some rest and, and take a little time. Uh, so he's obviously dealing with something. Uh, but, yeah, on the whole, they seem to be pretty healthy. Josh Newark, how good was Gavin Bartholomew today? Yeah, that's a guy we should really talk about. I mean, three catches for 48 yards, 24-yard uh, catch. He had 42 yards after the catch. Uh, just, I mean, the freshman tight end looks outstanding. You know, I, Lucas Crawl is – uh, you know, to me, looks like an NFL prospect. But when he's gone after this year, I mean, Gavin Bartholomew is ready to step in and, and just be a stud. He had a, a low block call, block below the waist on – um. it was a long running play, right? Uh, I think that's what it was. Or was it Taste Your Max Sweep? It was one of those plays. I, I think it was just like a long run by a Banacander or something like that. Uh, but, I mean, you know, catching the ball and blocking – He's really uh, excelling as a freshman. It's four games into his college season. Uh, let's see here. RJC Man 38 says, I'm happy today, but last week's loss took the playoffs and the New Year's Bowl off the table. Pitt doesn't get one loss. Um, they go perfect or get effed. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I guess if you were holding out hope for the New Year's Day Bowl and the playoffs, those, those, those hopes are probably uh, dashed. I, I would I would have to agree with you about that. So sorry, I, I you have my sympathies. Um, let's see here. Homer Simpson says I'm trying not to get too excited. The playoffs start for Pitt next week. Yeah, this is where this is where I mean the real games begin. You know, the, the, going into the ACC, playing your conference schedule, heading down to Georgia Tech. This is this is when it really counts. And and you know. After the Western Michigan game, the coaches and players were able to say, well, our goals are still in front of us and all this kind of thing. And that's true. Now you're in the games that um, now you're in the games that actually matter. You're the games that are really going to impact those goals as far as winning the Coastal Division and positioning yourself within the conference. And, and, and these games, not just on, on what they will mean for your success in the season, but they'll tell you about where you are. You're playing your peers now. Georgia Tech is your peer. Virginia Tech is your peer. Carolina is your peer. Virginia, Duke, Syracuse, Carol, and uh, uh, Miami. You know, and, and I shouldn't not even Syracuse. Just talking about the Coastal Division teams. These are your peers. So you've seen what happened. Uh, you beat UMass. You beat Tennessee. You lost to Western Michigan. You beat New Hampshire. Now you're gonna find out where you stack up against your peers. Are you know? And and it's it's not a there's nothing subjective about it. You either win or you lose. And and there's there's kind of a, a, a beautiful sort of simplicity in that. 
like, well, who's the best team in the conference? Who's this? Who's this? Who's number two? Who's number? Well, let's let them play the games. And when they play the games, we'll find out who's the best and who's number two and who's number 14 and number 13 and all that. And that's kind of fun. Um, let's see. Will Z says, uh, Georgia Tech is going to be itching to beat Pitt. And Mike Shaner follows up and says, uh, Jeff Collins was furious after the game last year. Who could forget handshake gate? Yeah, uh, there, there is something between Pitt and Georgia Tech. Paul Johnson used to take shots at Pitt every now and then. Although Paul Johnson took shots at everybody, I think. Uh, he was just sort of a cranky old man in a way that I really appreciated. Uh, the handshake gate thing last year with Jeff Collins, I don't think he was frustrated with Pat Narduzzi. I think he was frustrated with the officiating, and rightfully so. The officiating was caca in that Pitt Georgia Tech game last year. And and to be honest, it really didn't um it didn't favor uh Georgia Tech. <laughs> the calls, and this isn't always the case, but the calls more mostly went in Pitt's favor. Not all the calls, but most of the calls went in Pitt's favor. Uh, and especially, the, I think a lot of the questionable calls went in Pitt's favor, which we don't always say. That's not always the case, um, but they did. And I think that's what Jeff Collins was so frustrated about. And he blew up Narduzzi in the postgame handshake, but I don't think it was about that. I don't I don't think it was frustration with Narduzzi. I think it was frustration with the officiating and, and how he perceived the calls to be going. And so, you know, yeah, he's going to be fired up for this game. But, I mean, I, I think uh, Georgia Tech is going to be uh, – uh, fired up no matter what. I mean, because they're looking at it the same way Pitt is. It's funny, all these things we say about not really knowing what the ACC is or if it's strong or if it's weak or anything like that. And anybody in this team can be, anybody in this conference can be beat and every, you know, there's no world beaters. Everybody else is feeling that same way too. You know what I mean? Everybody else is looking at the ACC and been like, hmm, we can win here. We can win a bunch of games. And uh, that's, you know, it's good for Pitt. But everybody else is going to have that same approach. Georgia Tech is looking at this as, okay, now we're playing our peers. How are we going to stack up? Um, let's see. Brock McDonough, has your guy Khalil Anderson seen any snaps so far this season? No, he hasn't. Uh, Noah Bigelow, is, you know, when they went to a freshman corner, they went to Noah Bigelow. So, you know, Khalil Anderson not, not getting out there. I see Khalil Anderson around the facility. He looks great. I mean, he's tall. You know, I, I, I know people around – Pitt are excited about him, but uh, it's, you know, apparently he's behind Noah Bigelow now. I think he's going to be really good for Pitt, though. I think his future is pretty bright. All right, last one here. RJC Man 38 says, winning the ACC would be a good optic, but when you lose the Western Michigan, that stain will follow you your entire season. That sucks. It's true. I, and, and and I've said the same kind of thing. Like, you, you don't live that down. You know what I mean? You never can erase that. Pat, or Dave Wanstead won nine games in 2008, but he can never erase the stain of losing uh, to Bowling Green in the season opener. No matter where this season ends, you're always going to be, it's 2021 is always going to be the year that Pitt lost to Western Michigan. Pat Narduzzi is always going to be the coach who lost to Western Michigan. That's, that's always going to be the case. You can't get away from that. You can't shed it. But you can move forward and do the best with what you've got over the course of the next nine games. They just won one in, uh, like I say, a pretty much flawless performance. And um, it's hard to find too many faults in that. And I think, I, I don't, is it going to be a springboard into the ACC schedule? I don't know. Um, but is it a good step in the right direction? <laughs> you know, is, is it good to have some good vibes heading into the ACC? I think absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Pick gets the win. 77 to 7. Um, and uh, yeah, they're 3 and 1. You know, 3 and 1 heading into the ACC. It's not where you wanted to be at the end of September. You wanted to be 4 and 0. Oh. That didn't happen. So you're 3 and 1, and you're going into conference play. And you've got an opportunity to do a lot of things, to have a lot of success, to string a lot of wins together. These are teams that you can beat. Let's see if you actually uh, you are capable of beating. We'll see if you pull it out uh, or pull it off. Of course, you can uh, stay tuned to PantherLair.com throughout the week. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. You can, uh, you know, it's the most comprehensive source of Pitt Sports news on the internet. Football, basketball, recruiting, you can find it all at PantherLair.com. And, of course, message boards where you interact with hundreds and thousands of your closest Pitt fan friends. Panther-Lair.com, Pittsburgh.Rivals.com. 
Com. So make sure you hang out there throughout the weekend. Lots of people are going to be talking about the aftermath of this game, getting ready for Pitt, Georgia Tech. And then when the game happens on Saturday, Pitt at Georgia Tech, noon kickoff in Atlanta. We'll have a game thread, lots of activity on the message boards throughout the day. Wednesday night, don't forget the Panther Show, 8.30 p.m. We go live every Wednesday night to talk about Pitt sports. If you're listening to this podcast later in the weekend and you want to get in on the conversation, come hang out, youtube.com slash pantherlair.com. So, Appreciate everybody who came out for the live stream today. Pitts 3 and 1, 77 to 7 win over New Hampshire. We'll see what they do next week against Georgia Tech. Thanks again to everybody for uh tuning in. Have a great rest of the weekend. Have a great uh, week. We will talk to you on Wednesday night.